Good morning. Palm Sunday, hard to believe that, isn't it? As of now, we're praying for Josh Koenig, who is on the road to recovery, and what a blessing that is. And we just want to pray for Josh and the Koenigs and just praise God for that. Second thing is we started on Zoom two Bible studies this past week, a men's study Tuesday night at 7. We're studying Knowing God. We're in chapter 17. But if any of you guys want to just join us for discussion and fellowship, call me and I'll tell you how to do it. The ladies have two studies, Wednesday at 1 and 7, and it's also a time of fellowship. And if you'd like to be a part of that, call Molly and she'll be glad to tell you that. When I read books, sometimes I like to share with you what the book is and what's in it. This one's called Gentle and Lowly by a man named Dane Ortland, And I'm going to refer to it in our Holy Thursday service on Thursday night. But I just want to read you Ephesians 2, 7. The Apostle Paul says, So that in the coming ages he, God, might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now listen to what Ortland says. For those not in Christ... This life is the best it will ever get. For those in Christ, for whom Ephesians 2, 7 is the eternal vista just around the next bend in the road, this is the worst that life will ever get. Or this life is the worst it will ever get, meaning even the best in life <clears throat> is nothing compared to heaven. So even though we're going through the coronavirus, we can say, yes, it's bad, but the best for the Christian is yet to come. And I want us to hold on to that hope in Jesus. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So let us begin to worship the Lord Jesus. Our scripture is in Luke 19, 41 to 44. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is saying this as he approached Jerusalem weeping because of the non-repentant attitude of most of the people in the city. And that's what we're talking about on Palm Sunday. The Lord be with you and also with you. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts. With my song I give thanks to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this Palm Sunday. <clears throat> we can come and worship and thank you for the victory you bought for us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for filling our lives with your gracious Holy Spirit. We thank you we can worship together, even though we're not together in our building, but we're together in spirit, in our homes, worshiping you, thanking you for your great covenant love for us. Bless us in our service this day. May we learn great truths about you to edify us in our Christian walk. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I bent Judah as my bow. I made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Talking prophetically about the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. Now, our sponsor reading comes from John chapter 15, and I chose this again just because of the uni unity that is ours as Christian people. and just reminds us again of what a blessed thing it is to be united to Jesus. It's John 15, 1 through 11. I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. In that need to think about the joy that's ours in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. Thank you for filling our lives with the, just the beauty of your Spirit. We thank you, God, even though we're living in very trying times as a nation, <clears throat> even trying times for our families during this time. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that your love never wanes. You surround us with your arms of care and concern for us. And we thank you, God, for that. So we thank you this Palm Sunday morning. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We remember that even in the midst of this uh, Kored 19 that we're going through, that Jesus Christ is our Lord, cares for us. So we pray today, O oh God, that you would just ease us if we're fearful, calm us down if we're anxious. Remind us again that you hold our life in your hands. Remind us again that you are a God of providence, that you uphold all things, all things, after the counsel of your own will. And we implicitly trust you so we do pray today, O oh God, for ourselves. We pray for a greater love for you, to realize how much you love us. We pray for our families. We pray for our church family. We thank you that Josh is on the road to recovery. We pray that uh, everyone in our church would stay well and stay safe. We pray for our president, the, the pressures upon him. Some agree with him and some don't. The decisions he has to make, we pray for him, for our leaders in our country to really concentrate on what is the best thing for our nation, that we can work through this crisis and come out stronger than when we entered it. And so we just pray to abide by the decisions that are made for us as to when we can come worship you again, to trust our leaders to make wise decisions that we pray would keep us safe. So we thank you for our church. We thank you, God, for technology where we can worship you together today to praise the name of Jesus. So we just thank you, God, for your heartfelt love for us. Bless us, we pray, as we open up your word together. And we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I just again want to say how thankful I am to be your pastor just to see how much you love God, me and my family love one another, how you're really just pulling together in a very tough time. And we know that we're going to see this through. 
by the grace of God. He's going to strengthen us. And what lessons will he teach us is yet to be seen. He may be teaching us things right now, teaching us maybe greater patience, greater love, many, many things in our families. And I'm thankful for that too. And I'm thankful that I could just open for you the bread of life and share with you wonderful truths of God's word. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 12. Let us hear the inspired and fallible word of God. The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Three points today. Peace, first of all, palms, and then what kind of peace do we seek, and then perspectives. There were, first of all, three festivals at which the ancient Jews were expected to be present in Jerusalem. It was Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Now, Tabernacles might have been the most festive of occasions. It was the feast for the completion of the annual harvest. But Passover, by far, was the most solemn. There they remembered the Exodus deliverance when the blood of the Lamb was placed upon their doorpost and they were freed from the angel of death. Well, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem for the Passover was one of the highlights of his three-year ministry. It was the most dramatic event of his earthly life. So much so that the triumphal entry is mentioned in all four Gospels, and yet it's probably the most misunderstood. Well, what do we learn? Well, first of all, history has known many grand entries, hasn't it? Conquerors returning home from war, kings and queens arriving for coronation, and the saints celebrating their victory in the Super Bowl. But none is as remarkable as the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. It's also likely that the assembled crowd was truly vast. The first century Jewish historian Josephus recorded that the number of people there for Passover was some 2,700,000 people. Now that's a lot of people for a city that most of the year only had 40,000 people. It's also recorded there were over 250,000 lambs slain for at least 10 people present. Well, some think Josephus tends to exaggerate his numbers a little bit. So maybe there are about 250,000 people present for the Passover, but that is still a huge number of people. So why did Jesus enter Jerusalem as he did on Palm Sunday? Well, several answers to the question, the first of which is that he came to die. He came to die. The time had come at last when Christ was to die for the sins of his people. The time had come when the true Passover lamb was to be slain, when the true blood of atonement was to be shed, when the Messiah was to be cast off according to prophecy, when the way into the holiest was to be opened by the true high priest to all of his people. Knowing this, Jesus placed himself prominently under the notice of the whole Jewish nation, he died in a week when by his remarkable public entry into Jerusalem, he caused the eyes of the entire nation to be fixed upon him. Now turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, another explicit explanation of what Jesus Christ was doing. Mark 10, verse 32. He said to his disciples, <clears throat> when they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. 
and they will mock him and spit on him and they will flog him. Against this background, Jesus entered Jerusalem as he did, not to win the people over for those days were past, but to goad the Pharisees and the chief priests into action to precipitate the events that he knew <coughs> awaited him. Now go back to John 12. As Jesus approached Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, the effect was explosive. Look at verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, John's gospel is the only record to note the palm branches. As Jesus approached, the people draped the robe with their cloaks, we read in Matthew 21, 8, and palm branches. Now, why palm branches? Well, that's a curious detail since palms played absolutely no role in the Passover feast. So the waving of palm branches would seem to indicate that this event took place during the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles took place at the same time. But why again the palm branches? Some are waving the palm branches not for the Feast of Tabernacles, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? In what we call the intertestamental period, the time from the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, and John the Baptist, something took place that would define the Jewish people in terms of their national identity for centuries to come. In the second century BC, the temple was desecrated by a man named Antichius IV Epiphanes. He was the leader of the Seleucid Empire. In response, a Jewish man named Mattathias, who was committed to the ancient covenant of Israel, determined to rescue the temple and the nation from the invasion of the Seleucids. Mattathias became the leader of a guerrilla group that fought against the Seleucids. When Mattathias died, the leadership of this insurrectionist movement passed to his son Judas, who became known as Judas Maccabeus, whose name was the Hammer. I like that name, the Hammer. Judas Maccabeus became a national hero, and he was then wreaking havoc among the troops of the Seleucids. He put so much pressure upon them that in 164 BC, they released the temple and the Jews to practice their own faith. That event was met with so much enthusiasm that a new feast was instituted. It was called the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights. And today, the Jews celebrate it under the name Hanukkah. And they celebrate Hanukkah around the same time that we do the coming of the Lord Jesus at Christmas time. Well, later, Judah's brother, Simon Maccabeus, drove the Seleucids out of Jerusalem altogether. And when that happened, he acclaimed a national hero, and it was celebrated with a parade. Now, in that parade, the Jews celebrated his victory with music and the waving of palm branches. At that point in Jewish history, the palm branch became a significant sign and symbol of a military victory, of a triumph. And that symbolism became so deeply rooted in the Jewish consciousness that when the Jews revolted against the Romans in the A.D. 60s, they minted their own coins with the image of a palm branch. It's a national symbol of victory. William Barclay writes that the Jews who waved these palms were looking on Jesus as God's anointed one, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who was to come. And there's no doubt that they were looking on him as the conqueror. To them, it must have been only a matter of time until the trumpets rang out and the call to arms sounded and the Jewish nation swept to its long-delayed victory over Rome and over the world. So that's what many people use the palm branch for, to signify Jesus as this military hero. So when the people waved their palm branches to welcome Jesus, they cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, why'd they say this? Well, so frequently were these words sung and repeated during the various feasts of Israel. They had become practically a fight song for the Jewish Independence Party. That's the spirit of those welcoming Jesus. It's evident from the fact that they added the words, even the King of Israel. It'd be much like when people say, Hail to the Chief, or God save the Queen, acclaiming him as a national hero. But what do the words really mean? 
The word Hosanna comes from a Hebrew word that literally means save now. Both the plea and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are found in what's called the Hallel. Now the Hallel was a series of psalms that were sung every morning at the Feast of Tabernacles. Psalms 113 to 118. So I want you to turn to Psalm 118 and look at verse 19. Psalm 118, verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you've answered me and have become my salvation. Remember, save now. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. Marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So some may have looked to Jesus for salvation. Others, though, wanted a national hero. So what type of peace did the people want? A key to understanding this event is that Jesus did not begin his entry mounted on a donkey. Now, the other Gospels make it clear that Jesus anticipated what would happen. He made miraculous provision for an unridden donkey to await him on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's called a foal. It had never been ridden. We read that in Mark 11, verse 2. But as Jesus arrived in full view of the crowd, he was walking. It's only atop the last ridge he mounted the donkey as a clear, symbolic statement. Now turn to Luke 19. Luke 19. Moving forward, Jesus observed the city itself soon coming into his view. You can imagine him coming up over the ridge and there's this city. He stopped. He looks at it. And he wept. Verse 42 said, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. He then prophesied, as he read a few minutes ago, Jerusalem's coming destruction. Jesus lamented the palm branches, or at least the kind of salvation that many proclaimed. He was not coming to be a national hero. He did present himself as Israel's true king, but not as the king whom the people were seeking. This was the provocative point made by the riding on the donkey. Now, a horse-mounted king, he came bent on war. The donkey was ridden by a king who came with peace. The point Jesus made should have been clear to all. The manner of entry could not have been more strongly renounced with the zealot's military idea of what a Messiah should be, so he didn't ride on a war horse. Jerusalem was offering Jesus the kingship, only the kind of kingship that Jesus pointedly rejected in the way that he came. He did not come to be an earthly king. So this explains how the crowd that so excitedly welcomed Jesus could call for his crucifixion a few days later. Jesus rejected their offer of a war-bound kingship on Palm Sunday, and they rejected his kingdom of peace on Holy Thursday. Not only many of the people, but also the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was the Christ or that he deserved to be worshipped as a king. They thought that what the people were doing was blasphemy. Look at verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. These men never did appreciate Jesus. Because of their jealousy, his popularity aroused their hostility. And here they even tried to silence his praise. You know, this is the way some people are, and I think in our country today too. Not only do they refuse to worship Jesus, but they don't want you to worship Jesus either. That was the attitude of the Pharisees but the king will have his worship. When the Pharisees told Jesus to silence the crowd, he answered in verse 40, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. By saying this, Jesus was claiming that he deserved the worship, not only of people, but the entire creation. Even if human beings stop singing his praise, he will have the glory he deserves. I think that's neat to think about. The very sinners of, of, of the, sorry, the very stones of the ground would open their mouths to declare their maker's praise. We read this in Romans chapter 8, that the creation waits with eager longing for the day of salvation, when it will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
Here, Jesus gives us the sense that in that painful longing, the creation is almost bursting to sing its song. The rocks are ready at any moment to break their stony silence and shout for joy, Jesus is king, the entire creation. Notice the dramatic contrast between what the people were saying and what Jesus was feeling. It's Palm Sunday. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, a symbol of royal peace. And people were singing his praises and calling him their king. But again, Jesus rightly perceived that many did not know who he really was, so he wept. The people were cheering. King of Sorrows is crying. Verse 42, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. But some people still regard as a triumphal entry was for Jesus a tearful entry. J.C. Ryle said, we know but little of true Christianity if we do not feel a deep concern about the souls of unconverted people. A lazy indifference about the spiritual state of others may doubtless save us much trouble. To care nothing whether our neighbors are going to heaven or hell is no doubt the way of, of the world. But this attitude, Ryle said, is very unlike Christ. To have the passion that Jesus had for people who are lost in their sins is to weep for their sorry condition and cry out for their salvation. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing. John reminds us that Jesus' entry on a donkey perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah. Now you can turn if you want to to Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. We read again, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now Zechariah's prophecy provides a rich understanding of the coming Messiah describes the coming king as righteous, having salvation, humble, bringing peace. Now the next verse continues by foretelling the end of warfare and the bringing of peace to all the nations of the world. That's why Jesus came. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, another name for Israel, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations, his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the day we long for when there is worldwide peace, when Jesus comes back. So against the backdrop of this well-known prophecy, we see how strongly Jesus' manner of entry served as a rebuke to the mood of many in Jerusalem. Little did the Jews appreciate the kind of Messiah that they sought. He was contrary to the Savior who many people wanted Jesus to be. He was prophesied to be the Savior, to die for the sins of his people. So what a warning this is to us. <clears throat> As Christian people, do we understand who Jesus is and why he came? He came to die. He came to save me from my sins. We should not try to make him anything other than who he is, and yet there's many, so many false ideas about who Christ is. Oh, he was a good man. Oh, he was a kind man. Oh, he was a leader. Oh, he showed love and he did this and that. He came to die for the sins of his people. Let us never forget that. Let us never have any other agenda about the Lord Christ. The Jews in Zechariah's time didn't have a king. Their last monarch perished in the Babylonian captivity. So in that kingless era, God's people were told to look for the coming of the ruler whom God would send, Jesus Christ, one who fits and fulfills the messianic expectations of the Old Testament. So here's a king who's just and having salvation, who came in meekness and affliction. One commentator said this of Jesus, this prophecy was intended to introduce, in contrast to earthly warfare and kingly triumph, another kingdom of which the just king would be the prince of peace, who was meek and lowly in his coming, who would speak peace to the heathen, whose sway would yet extend to earth's utmost bounds. If there ever was a true picture of the Messiah king and his kingdom, it is this. And if ever Israel was to have a Messiah or the world a savior, he must be such as described in this prophecy.
prophecy. So who is he? He came to die for our sins on the cross. Now, the only person in all of history who can fit this description is Jesus Christ. And here's a wonderful picture of his person. The Messiah who comes as king. First of all, we're told he is righteous. Isaiah 42 one says of him, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. The one who establishes righteousness is the one who is pleasing in God's sight, who's righteous in all his ways. So we are righteous in Christ. Righteous is bright living. So because of the righteousness of Christ, I'm saved. We're saved by the active and passive obedience of Jesus. His passive obedience was his death on the cross. His active obedience was his perfect life. So because of his perfect life, his righteousness, I seek to be righteous. And so you and I want to follow Jesus to be righteous in him. Also, God's coming king is humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The donkey was a royal mount in Israel's earlier days. The judges, as well as David, rode a donkey, and Solomon, the king of peace, rode one in his coronation ceremony. This is associated with royalty, but it's characterized by humility and gentleness of spirit. So if I'm righteous, I'm going to be humble. Pastor David Strain, a first Presbyterian in Jackson, is preaching through the book of First Peter. He came to 1 Peter 5, 6, which says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. He said the mighty hand are times of trial, such as this COVID-19. That's a tremendous trial for our nation and for us. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So in other words, humble means I'm trusting God. I'm saying, God, I don't understand it all. I don't know why it's happening, but I'm humble front of you. Now, how did Jesus act when he faced Gethsemane and the cross? He never complained against his father. He never lost his temper, never said things he shouldn't have said. He trusted God. That's what humility is. Same thing with us. I don't want to uh, complain against God. I don't want to complain and, and say and do things I shouldn't because I'm frustrated. I don't want us to look back on this trial and say, I blew it. I don't want us to look back and say, I should have learn something more. I should have trusted God more. We do it now. So we are righteous in Christ. We live a right life. And because of that, we're humble. I hope you see the connection. We've talked about Hebrews 12, 11, And I love that verse because it fits so many situations in life. No trial for the present is pleasant, but grievous. The word grievous means pain and sorrow. And yet we can apply that to many things, but apply it now. But afterwards, see, the Bible promises there is an afterward. It yields the peaceful fruit of what? Righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Peaceful fruit of right living. I've been trained. The word, is gym, the word gymnasium comes from the word trained in the Greek language. God is training us, working with us, knocking off rough edges, refining us. We can say this trial has a purpose to make us more like Jesus. The world may not see that. We see that. So everything that happens to us has a purpose. So God, thank you for showing me through this trial in my life, family's life, church's life, how to be righteous and humble as Jesus would. I think it's neat that we can learn such things like that from the, even a trial like this. So we've, we've seen the palms, we've seen the peace, and now perspectives need to meditate on the contrast between the person of Christ and that of every earthly king. Earthly kings rule for their own riches and their glory. Christ rules for your salvation and mine. Earthly kings reign from above the people in haughty power. This king condescends to dwell among us. Jonathan Edwards said, his condescension is great enough to become their friend, to become their companion to unite their souls to him in spiritual marriage. Yea, it is great enough to abase himself, yet lower for them, even to expose himself to shame and spitting. Yea, to yield up himself to a shameful death for them. He came down to die for us. In Jesus' life and ministry, we find one example of humble meekness after another. 
And such a king as Jesus is worth shouting over. That's why the prophet enjoins the people, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. On the day her king came, when Jesus rode in the back of a donkey, the prophecy was fulfilled. He came to die for his people. Yet despite Jesus' clear statements, the disciples were puzzled by the triumphal entry just as they were by the cross. The ignorance of the disciples is remarkable since Jesus had so clearly told them what was about to happen. And we read it a few minutes ago in Luke's Gospel. Only later, when they'd been enlightened by the Holy Spirit, did they understand the meaning of Jesus' ministry. So as believers today, let us never misunderstand why Jesus came. Do you know why he came? Can you say, he came to die for me? Do you know what atonement means? Do you know what it means to be justified? Do you know what it means to say that he came to change my life? Do you understand the transformation of your life in Christ? These things are essential for us to understand as Christian people. Read the passage of Palm Sunday. Why did he come? He came to die. Many waved the branches wanting a national hero, but others waved them because he alone is our triumphant king. Remember, there were many who hailed Jesus because they either witnessed or heard of his great miracle in chapter 11 when he raised Lazarus. And they wanted to kind of take that power that Jesus had and turn it to their own purposes. When Jesus fed the 5,000 people in Luke chapter 9, many followed him just because they wanted to fill their stomachs. They didn't care about him. They wanted their stomachs full. They didn't care about what Jesus did with Lazarus. How can we harness that power? We can follow Jesus for the wrong reason. Today it's called the prosperity gospel. What can Jesus do for me instead of what can I do for him to show him my love and my just thankfulness for his dying for me. Is anything sadder than someone who would come to a church like ours and never grab the meaning of Jesus? James Boyce said some years ago in one of his books that people could sit in a church like ours under the preaching of the word, the sacraments, and be completely lost and have no idea of who Jesus is. Never grab the meaning of Jesus' life. This broke the Savior's heart especially because he knew how much they would suffer for rejecting his grace. This added to his sorrow. Jesus didn't grieve for their rejection only, but for the suffering it would bring. Go back to Luke 19.43. Luke 19.43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. All these words came true. With perfect foreknowledge, the Son of God was prophesying what would happen when Jerusalem was conquered by the Romans in A.D. 70. The city was surrounded as the general Titus set up great siege work, works around the city's walls. The stones of the city were torn down. The temple was destroyed. The streets ran red with the blood of women and children. Caesar wanted to make it impossible for anyone to believe that Jerusalem had ever been inhabited. This all happened just the way Jesus said it would, according to the justice of God. And since God is perfectly righteous and supremely worthy of our worship, we're always responsible for our failure to give him the full honor he deserves. So again, Jesus is a loving God, but he's also a just God. And he judges those who reject him. That's, what he was, that's why he wept on Palm Sunday. This is true when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, is he the king of your life? Do you understand what it means to say that he died for me, that I praise him for the reason that he came? He came to die. The crown that Jesus came to wear was not a crown of gold, but of thorns. The throne he came to ascend was a cross. So what does he say to those of us who want to follow him? Well, flip back to nine, Luke 9, 23. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever 
would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Unless we're willing to meet Jesus at the cross, finding our life not only in his death, but in our own death to sin and self, we're rejecting Jesus as he came and as he comes today. How do you see Jesus? On the road to Jerusalem, are you waving palm branches saying, thank you, God, for dying for me? Are you waving palm branches for another reason? You want something else from Jesus. The Lord Jesus did not come to rescue a puny nation tucked in a corner of the world. He came to rescue his people from their sins of every tribe, every nation throughout the world. And did he come this day, if he hasn't, to rescue you? Maybe for the first time in your life, you're understanding who Jesus is what he came to do. When Jesus returns on the glory of his kingdom, when all who reject him are judged, and all sin is put away in hell, Jesus will look upon a whole world that he saved. The king is coming again, and the book of Revelation pictures him as riding not on a donkey, but a horse for war. In other words, he came the first time as the Lamb of God. The second time, he's the Lion of Judah. And when he's conquered and judged all that stands against him, then there's peace forevermore. And that's what he came to proclaim, peace to the nation, peace to hearts who turn from their sinful ways and acknowledge him as Lord, not making him what he's not, worshiping him for who he is, our blessed Lord. So this Palm Sunday, we would wave palm branches, thanking him for coming to die for us, sacrificing himself for us, conquering sin and death, that we may worship him as our Lord and our Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you on this Palm Sunday we come to worship you. Thank you for being our conquering king. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for teaching us plainly in the Bible why Jesus came and what his mission was in coming and for saving us. May we rejoice in you this day and every day. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ go before you to lead you and to guide you. May he be above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, now and forevermore, amen.